since it is quite late, I, I don't think we will have uh, a lot of time, but I just wanted to give you a few words of introduction before we have the, the general question session and a perspective from uh, cognitive science and neuroscience on, on these questions of mathematics. Um, I think that there are really three big questions about mathematics in, and its role in science. The first one is what is the nature of mathematics, which was touched upon by the first uh, speaker, by, sorry, by the second speaker, Peter Scholzen. Uh, second, why is it applicable to the physical world? And can we improve its applicability uh, for the greater good and for other sciences? And third, uh, how can we teach it better? And so I'd like to touch about these three questions briefly, and then we can have general discussion. The first one, uh, nature of mathematics, is of course a huge discussion uh, that uh, Marcello uh, touched upon. Um, the answer from cognitive neuroscience might be that mathematics is a mental exploration, one could even say a game, that we conduct inside our brains by recombining the basic concepts that were given to us by our evolution and by our observation. So there is quite a bit of evidence now that our brains are endowed with a basic sense of, uh, or we, call it, we say also core knowledge of number and of geometry. Uh, there are beautiful experiments even in infants of a few hours of age showing a sense of number in young infants. Uh, there is experiments on geometry as well. And uh, we can show, for instance, that even people in the Amazon, in the absence of any education, already have a notion of Euclidean geometry and have the same concept. Uh, of Euclidean geometry that we have. Um, uh, we begin to know a lot more about the brain mechanisms of mathematics, because this is, this is my area. We know that there are brain areas that systematically light up when we do mathematics. They're not the same one as language. Um, and we begin to know how neurons encode this concept, at least for number. Uh, the discovery of neurons that are tuned to number indicates how deeply this is engraved into our brain. Um, we know also that this is relevant to higher mathematics because we have interpolated data points. So we have the starting point, this core knowledge, but we have also uh, mental representations and studies of brain imaging of higher mathematical concepts all the way into scanning mathematicians. And the very interesting finding is that the same brain areas keep being involved, just uh, activated by more abstract concepts. We still don't understand how such abstract concepts are represented in the brain, but we begin to see where they are and how they change uh, with education. And I, I want to say one thing also, this is, even occurs in the blind. And I think it's relevant to one of the statements that Peter Scholz was making, that geometry is an abstraction of those things that we can perceive with our eyes. Well, it has to be a little bit more abstract than that because even blind mathematicians exist, can uh, be a very high level and uh, develop the same exact concept. So it has to come from inside, at least as much as from outside. Um, now, with these ideas in mind, I think the second question, the question of applicability of math become a little bit more understandable. Uh, this is a very big question, again, that Eugene Wigner was calling the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. And um, maybe it's no longer a mystery. We are returning to the physical world the basic concepts of number and of space that we extracted from the natural world during the evolution of the brain. We, are, we have learned to analyze these concepts, to refine them, to recombine them using a language inside the brain. So in this respect, and this is a word of discussion uh, for uh, Denise Hassabi's beautiful presentation, it seems to me perfectly possible that AI will surpass uh, the human brain in this respect, because it's a form of computation, mathematics. I think AI already uh, provides a model for mathematical intuition, uh, there are several papers out there extremely recently, including some from your team. There is one called the Ramanujan machine, super interesting uh, machine that is able to extract formulas or expressions a little bit like Ramanujan was doing without having a proof, but having an intuition of a beautiful formula. And beauty is not far in this machine. Um, however, I would also be critical, and we discussed that over lunch, but I think key elements are missing in AI, maybe symbolic, explicit representations, this was right uh, on my left, uh, the, the, the idea that perhaps we don't really, these machines don't really know explicitly. They have extracted some knowledge in an implicit form, but not yet explicit like we need in science. But by and large, uh, I would welcome, and I think we should welcome AI assistance for mathematics, because it's so hard and slow for all of us. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that it will be coming 
from the MIS or from others. And this leads me to my third point. We really need to ask how we can teach uh, mathematics. This was raised in your uh, presentation. Um, this is really an urgent problem, not just in Africa, in many countries. I'm very sorry to report from the state of education in France, uh, since I, I now serve as the president of the Scientific Council for Education, we know from very good data that there is a three decade loss, a progressive loss in uh, children's ability to do mathematics. And uh, it is in a country where mathematics was very high valued for many years. Um, we know that uh, it's not just the average, but the social dispersion, which is increasing. That is to say, uh, there is social inequality in the face of mathematics. And we have to remember that we are out of an epidemic that led to massive lack of education for a whole generation. It's some countries lost a whole one year, sometimes two years, of education. Uh, how do we catch up with that? It's estimated in the US, there was a recent paper, that uh, the COVID epidemic led to a 30-year regression. There was steady progress in education, and there's been a 30-year uh, backpack. Um, and of course, there is gender inequality. And that is very stupid, because all of the data on the brain shows that there is no difference, no major difference whatsoever in the initial states of mathematics. We have now new data from French schools, from 2 million French children, absolutely zero difference before they enter school. And after four months of school, there is an advantage for boys. And after one year of school, there is a massive advantage for boys. So it is something that school schooling, not necessarily teachers, but the whole enterprise of schooling somehow biases many girls to think that mathematics is not for them. And I think it's a massive problem. So these are the issues I wanted to raise for discussion. I'm sure you have many other questions. But uh, I think we need to keep in mind both the forefront, fields medal, AI that will push the science, but also the fact that the whole world needs more education in mathematics, and that's not an easy thing to accomplish. Maybe we can help with AI, and maybe we can help with cognitive science. Thank you. So now, sorry, this was just supposed to be an introduction to the general discussion and my thoughts about it, uh, but I'm sure you have questions to each other, and maybe to Demis is here. Okay, you Thank you. You spoke directly to the question I was going to ask, which was about Wigner's famous 1960 article. And it, it occurred to me over the years that one way to solve Wigner's problem is to adopt a pure Kantian approach, whereby mathematical ideas are simply a priori. And so our experience necessarily is mathematically structured. As I heard you, though, and I, I think you're quite right, you're not adopting a Kantian perspective, but namely over the millennia of evolution, We've derived from the world a certain objective intelligibility. We've thought about it deeply, so these become in time structuring elements in the mind. Which leaves, I think, Wigner's question still an interesting one from a philosophical and religious perspective. Namely, why should the world be intelligible in its structure in such a way that it corresponds to the highest level of mathematics? So I still think it remains a very interesting question, and I agree with your account of the sort of etiology of the mind's being marked by mathematical structure. But I think it's still very suggestive for um, uh, philosophical and religious meditation. Demis, do you want to respond to that, maybe? Respond to that and also your, your, your first opening remarks as well. I mean, um, but from my perspective, I would say that maths is uh, this incredible description language for nature, and perhaps it's so incredibly good for a lot of things that we almost think maybe it's the truth itself. That's just my personal opinion of, of how, it, how it is. But just in terms of intuition, which is something I've been thinking a lot about, um, both mathematical intuition and scientific intuition, one of the things you can think, I mean, it, it, intuition is something we regard as very human, as a capability. Uh, but um, and, and one way I define it is, is it's knowledge that we've acquired through experience. I mean, there's no other way of acquiring knowledge. Um, but uh, it's only implicitly known. So we can't, we don't consciously have access to that knowledge. So, um, so then we call it intuition, right? Because we can't introspect it ourselves um, when we think about it. And um, that doesn't apply just to mathematics and other things, but also everyday things like how we swim or ride a bike. And traditionally, those things have been very difficult to articulate in AI or in programming because programming is an explicit task, traditional programming. So if you can't, if we ourselves don't know the recipe for cycling a bike or doing mathematics, the intuition behind that, we can't then write a program to do it. 
But the reason that we're making progress now is because instead of trying to write down the solution directly, we attack it indirectly by writing a learning system, which will then learn itself for itself, possibly from the same kind of data that we as humans learn from, and maybe more data because of the nature of the computer. And therefore, it can come up with its own intuitions in some sense. So if you look at the, the series of work that we've done, Go, as opposed to chess, so Go is, the, is, 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 is more complex than chess and is what's played in Asia in, instead of Go, instead of chess in the West. But it's a much more esoteric game, much more beautiful in some ways. And it's so complex, you know, you, it's sort of an, you, you play it with your intuition. Whereas chess, you generally play with calculation. It's a calculation game. And, um, and, before, and that's one of the reasons why Go took 20 more years to crack with AI than chess. And the way we did it was to not explicitly write in the rules or heuristics about how to play Go, but let the system learn for itself and mimic the intuition of the Go players. And then because of that, then I started thinking about other areas where we believe intuition operates. So in, including in protein folding, interestingly, because um, again, there was a, a citizen game uh, of protein folding where they turned protein folding into a game. And some amateur scientists were actually able to fold some proteins as back in the late 2000s. And I was very intrigued by that, perhaps presumably using their own intuition about what are the right shapes about proteins. And then finally, you know, now mathematics. And we talked about Ramanujan, who's the ultimate intuitive mathematician. And perhaps again, we can start making some, mimicking some of that uh, capability in AI. And just a comment on that. It seems to me that in AI, you are trying to recapitulate sometimes at least both evolution and learning. And the problem of the human brain may be simpler, actually, because we have inherited a lot from evolution, so we don't start from nothing, unlike alpha zero, maybe. Uh, we start from uh, a lot of concepts that are already inscribed from the start, and maybe that gives some uh, explanation for the Platonist intuition uh, that many mathematicians report, because it really looks like these rules are extremely rigid. There's no way to get out of number. There's no way to get out of space as we conceive it, because this is essentially the way our brain uh, operates from the start. I think you had a... Uh, okay, I think this was a fabulous section. I think we covered many topics, but uh, I would love to talk about AlphaFold, but we'll stay out of it because it's going to become too technical. But I want to talk about the idea of AI and mathematics. Uh, there's a discussion of the word intuition something that based, I think if you have a mathematical framework, a mathematical space, it doesn't have to have any connection to the world. I think it can be totally abstract the way. AI from the other end, just to be provocative, is something say, I don't have to think anymore. I just throw all this data and the machine will give me the answer. I know the successful case and that's not the case. So how do we sort of, uh, reconcile the idea that basically a lot of the great mathematics came from great minds and great creativity from the other end where people say now I can stop thinking just being provocative and let the machine get the data and learn something. I think uh, Francis asked the question, are you learning something? And basically what learning means and I think that's a, something that would throw out the people talking about it. About the meaning of learning and something versus creation and intuition versus just throw data and hope that the system can do something for you. Peter, maybe? If not, that uh, Marcello, you had a question. I have many questions, but the one, two. <laughs> the first, uh, in your experience, that is for the chairman, especially for all, for all, but especially for the chairman. In your experience, the superior animals like the monkey have some kind of mathematics or geometry in the brain. This is one. The second is the, the, the end of the meeting is collaboration for peace. The mathematics, in one sense, have some collaboration with peace. Sorry. Oh, oh, so, oh, Peter, you want to answer? No, no, sorry, I, I didn't. Uh, okay, I, I will address maybe just the first point because I think it's a very concrete point. You're completely right. There is there is a big difference between humans and other animals in re with respect to mathematics. Uh, it's quite interesting. I think the foundations 
are given by evolution, and they obviously have a long evolutionary history. So both the concept of number, at least approximate number, and the concept of space uh, are wired in many animals, not just humans. And it's really deep uh, engraved into many, many brains, not just mammals, fish, uh, even insects. Um, however, uh, humans have a special way to recombine this information. And we are only beginning to scratch the surface of what are these differences. I think it's a wonderful question. But there are very clear differences. For instance, we just proved recently that even when you just look at a square, well, humans seem to be the only ones who grasp the regularities in a square. And if you see a square like you do in Lascaux, you know it's a human who has written or painted that on the wall. There's no other animals that does this sort of symbolic uh, drawing. Demis, you want to intervene and then maybe he yeah, maybe I can then answer um, Jose's in, you know, sort of provocative question, which I think are great questions. Um, there's two things I would say about that. Firstly, on the um, the understanding of the system, I think we're we're just at the beginning now where these systems can actually do useful things. So I think there needs to be a whole field actually of um, analysis of these systems to kind of um, in this very similar analogy to the way we analyze brains, you know, with imaging and all these tools. We should do that with the virtual brains. I call it virtual brain analytics. And I think start to break down like what the representations are and maybe even extract what the intuition, the machine or the insight the machine has got or the structure has. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of human creativity that goes into that and in building the algorithms and ordering the data and so on. It's just different to the way we would think about it before. So I think it's just as much human ingenuity involved in these systems as there always was in, in traditional solutions. Um, the other point I would just make that's related to this is where, where, and we were talking about this over lunch, is that at the moment, um, it's, it's, the AI is just a tool. It's not an entire scientist itself. It can't conjecture about or hypothesize about something or ask the right question. That all comes from the human engineer and designer, right? And that's for the foreseeable future. And there's an interesting thing of like, um, if we think about that as human creativity, I would say that there are sort of three levels of it and computers can do two levels. So interpolation, which is like averaging what you see, data points. Extrapolation, like we saw in Go, where it plays loads of games of Go against itself and it can come up with a new Go move, a new Go idea that humans couldn't have. But it can't do true invention yet, which is, which I would say is the equivalent of inventing Go or inventing chess. So it can come up with a great chess move, even a new chess move or a new Go move that was never seen before, but it can't invent Go. Yeah, so there's something missing still, and it was interesting to think about what that might be. Just a short follow-up. That's a very interesting comment. And I think, I didn't want to be that aggressive, but you were. At which point you switch from tool to science. I didn't want to use the word tool because I thought it was too pejorative, but since you use it, I am allowed to use it now. Uh, is that, uh, and, I, and I, I, I'm very confused about it. Sometimes when I teach AI, I say, at which point do we, is that just a tool and some engineering where I use no ideas and some case success? And in which case you said you're going to switch to a level that actually you're going to learn something. What I want to learn in me, but I really like Chris. Sorry, I, I hate to cut a very lively discussion, but time is passing quickly. Unless Peter, online, you want to have one final word from the mathematician's point of view. Uh, no? Oh, thanks, but yeah, no, I'm fine. Thanks. Nice to have you with us. Yes. And uh, so I think we're going to call it a close and have a coffee now, right? And thank you very much to all the speakers and uh, online or on site. Thank you.